Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Kaplowitz. I am the co-founder and executive director of the Rutgers Center for Women in Business, where we remove barriers, build community, and empower women. Today, we are going to talk about another barrier that was just erected um, that we will discuss and um, try to work through of how, how to remove as well. Um, I am so honored to join with me um, two esteemed colleagues. The first is Yana Rogers. Thanks, Yana. Um, Yana is a professor in the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations in the School of Management and Labor Relations here at Rutgers University. She is also the faculty director of the Center for Women and Work at Rutgers, and our centers have collaborated quite often on projects. She specializes in research on women's health, labor market status, and well being and is one of the foremost researchers on the economics of abortion rights and access. She has regularly worked as a consultant for the World Bank, United Nations, Asian Development Bank, and was president of the Inter International Association of Feminist Economists. Thanks for joining us, Yana. Um, also have with me Nadia Kamis, who is the Director of Corporate Engagement for Planned Parenthood's Brand Culture and Communications Division. She has spent her entire career in public and private and nonprofit sectors, really working to build public-private partnerships and business-driven solutions that promote inclusive socioeconomic growth, gender equality, and sustainable development. She has spent years working in the international public and nonprofit sectors, um, working with International Labor Organization, New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the B Team and Vital Voices. Thanks for joining us, Nadia. Great, so we're just gonna dive in. And I think to start, um, would love just to get a sense of where folks are, are calling from. So uh, Viviana, can you go to the next slide? Great. Um, we're going to do a couple polls right now. Um, I think the easiest thing is actually to use a QR code. Let's go to the next slide, actually. For our first question, um, using one word, describe how you feel about the recent Supreme Court decision and overturning Roe v. Wade. We're going to generate a word cloud. You can use the QR code at the top, and it should prompt you. You do not need to enter a name. Um, this is all anonymous. Um, I also want to remind folks as we are doing this webinar, as folks are typing in, um, the session is recorded. The chat is not. We want to make this interactive. So feel free to use the chat. If you don't feel comfortable putting a question in the chat, you can directly um, communicate with the panelists as well. Um, we understand this is a sensitive conversation, but we do feel it's important to build community and support for one another. Um, and with that, I want to start reading. Okay, heartbroken, angry, nauseous, enraged, horrified, exasperated, dismayed, disappointed, sad. We're feeling a lot of feels right now. Um, and so with that, one of the things that we like doing at the center is acting. And so as we were thinking about what we could do when the news broke, we thought it would be best to create this community for sharing, for understanding, to learning about resources, to understanding the why it's so important to have sexual and reproductive health care for everyone. Um, Disappointed. I think the biggest comment that I see is, is disappointment. And I, I think I personally sit in that camp as well. Um, next question, uh, Viviana, can you go to the next slide? So we know folks, you know, as you just told us, are living in different, um, different places. So again, using just one word, what will happen or what already has happened with abortion services in your state? So they're protected. Nothing has changed. Inundated, I think that's a good thing, inundated with all the different changes and what that's actually going to mean. 
We have a lot of folks here from New Jersey, so I'm assuming that we're going to see a lot of protected here. Um, safe, attacked, reinforced. Race, we, I see race in here. We're gonna talk a lot about race because there is a different impact for black and brown women um, based on the states that uh, you know these abortion restrictions are in. Um, so really, really it's, um, I, again, because we're here in New Jersey, I think we're gonna see an overwhelming amount that it is protected, but we're gonna also talk about what we can do for those folks that even if we are in New Jersey, for folks that maybe don't live here. So with that, Viviana, can you take down the slides? Um, I wanna start off, Yana, with, with you, um, because you are an expert in this area to really ground us, what are the overall implications for not having access to safe abortion in overall sexual and reproductive health care? Yeah. Um, well, the overall you know, implications have to do with a number of areas, including just a human rights point of view that um, your women and abortion seekers have a right to have access to this fundamental reproductive health service. Uh, there are health implications if um, people are delayed in getting abortion care and if these delays you know, cause them to have to get an abortion in another state in the second trimester these kind of abortions are riskier for the, the health of the abortion seeker. Um, and then what I've done quite a bit of research on is the economic implications, uh, which is a lot of what we're talking about today. And some of my research here has framed these issues at um, three different levels. We can think of the microeconomic aspects, the mesoeconomics, and the macro economics. Um, and very briefly, what do I mean by those? Well, at the microeconomic level, um, some of the costs of not having access to abortion services are really borne by the abortion seekers themselves, the individual people looking for these services, especially in states that now ban abortion, they're going to have to travel in some cases hundreds and hundreds of miles to go to other states that have these services, those states in turn may be inundated. And that was one of the words that I used in the poll, you know, with people coming from out of state to find services. Um, this means additional travel costs, hotel costs, um, lost wages, um, seeking childcare if these abortion seekers already have children that need cared for um, while the person's getting services somewhere else. So these are some of the microeconomic costs we need to consider. Um, at the MISO level, um, we're looking at costs to um, state governments and costs to health services. Um, if, let's say, uh, more people now um, get um, unsafe abortions, perhaps incomplete abortions with uh, medication abortions um, or other types of unsafe abortions like we used to see before Roe v. Wade, that will increase costs for healthcare systems in terms of treating um, unsafe abortions. Um, there's also costs to states that continue to protect services like we saw in the word cloud and having people come from other states. Um, now we need more staff to deal with that for some states. And at the macro level, there's quite a bit of research showing that when um, women do have access to safe abortion services, that increases the amount they invest in their own educations. Um, it increases labor force participation rates. There's even some research that shows there's less crime um, down the road. So there's a number of macroeconomic impacts, even to the extent of abortion access contributing positively to overall GDP in the macro economy. So I'll stop there. No, that, that is an incredible overview. And I like how you broke it up into the three different areas, starting with the personal and then going to the bigger macro um, environment as well. And we all know that having more women in the workforce increases overall GDP, mm -hmm. which is helpful. Um, Overall, Nadia, I want to turn it to you for a second. Um, we're going to talk a lot about what companies can do, what companies 
are doing. Um, before we jump in here, um, can you just give a general, you know, overview of, of what Planned Parenthood is? I think I, I don't want to assume anything because my dad always told me what happens when I assume. So I know it's not just about abortion services, but can can you educate us uh, on what that is that you also do? I'd be happy to, Lisa. Um, thanks for, for the opportunity to be here um, and to be with you all today. I hope my my um, sound is okay. Your sound is good. Your camera's jumping a little bit. Okay, maybe I'll turn my camera off just to preserve the line. Um, it's I, I work as um, part of a team that interfaces with businesses um, really in support of Planned Parenthood's mission. And um, the organization was established a hundred years ago, um, really with the mission to serve um, people in communities, particularly women with sexual and reproductive health care and access to education. Um, and the organization serves more than two and a half million patients per year. Um, one in five women of reproductive age visit us in their lifetime, but we also see men in, in a big spectrum of people. Um, and abortion is actually only 4% of our services. Um, a third of our services are contraception, um, but really they run the suite of primary care um, and, and reproductive health care from STI testing to pap smears um, and cancer screenings, prep medication for people living with HIV AIDS, STI tests, um, and of course doing um, a lot of primary care services that are not requiring insurance. Um, and 75% of our patients are below the poverty line. Um, and then we do have a political activism arm as well. No, that's great. And Nadia, the camera wasn't so bad, so I would definitely put it back on because we'd love to see you. Um, great. Um, so, you know, companies have, you know, we've seen a lot in the news in the mainstream media. Companies have offered travel reimbursement or paying for travel or including it um, in their healthcare plans. Why is that in and of itself not quite as simple as that may seem? That's for me, Lisa, yes? Yes, Nadia, yeah, sorry no, about that. Sorry, no, I mean, we've, we've been speaking to a lot of companies um, ranging from kind of the Fortune 500 companies that have kind of taken action a bit more slowly to publicly profess what they are working on, but that have quickly moved to cover and extend the benefits of their workforce, really guising it as a healthcare um, issue and extending coverage through their insurance providers. Um, but we saw a lot of companies that were not satisfied with just covering workers at their headquarters um, who were on full term time contracts and really wanted to ensure their hourly workers, people across their supply chain, whether they were working for warehouses or for you know logistics um, companies um, that were integrated into their, their company um, could access services. They started establishing community health funds and thinking about emergency relief funds um, and other ways that they could provide financial grants um, outright in, in complement to their healthcare services. Um, and so that was something that I think companies were navigating alongside obviously the ever changing legal landscape on the state level. Um, and so I think the more important thing is to have as many companies as possible really publicizing their benefits as well as obviously acting on them to show other companies that they need to be out there um, to really apply pressure at the state level um, to show that this is a healthcare issue, as Yana said, this is a human rights imperative and certainly an economic imperative. Um, and one so thing I wanted to add to Nadia's answer, what I've been seeing um, in the media is um, how exactly companies are providing benefits for abortion seekers. And there are some considerations, like if companies are doing it through their health insurance plans, apparently that will protect the privacy of abortion seekers. But if it's some other form like a direct reimbursement, um, that may not protect the privacy of abortion seekers. So people looking for these services do need to take into consideration what the privacy aspects are, especially since uh, abortion is still unfortunately stigmatized in our society and we still need to deal with that stigma. Right. So I think that's a great point. One thing I want to say, I'm putting my former corporate hat on, nothing that we say in this conversation is providing legal tax or accounting expertise or advice. Um, but Yana, Yana's spot on. And in my prior life, 
still not providing tax, legal, and accounting expertise right now. But in my prior life, I did place corporate uh, benefit plans for um, my the, a major Fortune 500 company. And you know there are protections depending on if the company is self-insured or not with HIPAA protections and ERISA protections. So definitely those folks that are on the company side listening to this right now, um, definitely check with counsel, check with your benefit providers as well to ensure that the you can you are protected and the employee's privacy is protected. I think the other thing that you know is is really important to make sure of is whatever the policy is, um, how do you convert that to it actually being practiced? So look at paternity leave, for example. A lot of companies have started, not enough, but some have started putting in place paternity policies. But if those policies aren't being taken advantage of, it might as well be like that tree that falls in the forest that nobody knows about. So I think you have to be really mindful to decrease, as Yana had mentioned, that stigma associated with this so folks feel empowered and confident that they're not going to have retaliation against them if they do take advantage of what's out there. Um, I want to move from just the travel reimbursement. And, and Nadia, you hit on this um, a little bit more. There's also been public announcements um, from companies like Google and Salesforce about relocating employees. Um, from Duolingo about changing corporate headquarters, um, from Patagonia about offering to bail out protesters. Um, and some companies are struggling at all, you know, to, to announce anything depending on, on where they are. You know, what, what else are you seeing from companies? What, el what else are you hearing? Thanks, um, Lisa. I think a, a lot of companies definitely want to ensure first and foremost that their people are covered. Um, I think a lot of companies that you named, um, particularly Patagonia um, and companies that have been more kind of progressive from the outset, but those that have really aligned with the issues um, that intersect with reproductive rights um, from gender equality to LGBTQ rights to, to racial justice and, and race equity, I think they are starting to realize the importance of being more externally facing about why this issue matters to them, um, abortion bans and restrictions, and obviously how it impacts their business, but also their consumers and communities. Um, and so I think a lot of brands are really looking how to be authentic in that way. So this is not just a one-off moment that they respond to, but that there's a consistent kind of engagement between both, the, you know, with their employees and the C-suite, as well as externally with their consumers and how they're communicating that. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around reviewing political giving, um, and this is something I think we saw just recently with Match Group um, that have been called out for political giving to both sides while being really at the forefront of, you know, advancing reproductive health care um, and being out front about supporting their employees, given they had a, their headquarters in Texas. So they were out front about the six week ban, but then really their former CEO and, and current board member and current CEO are now very kind of active. Um, but I, I would just say that um, they started stop donating now altogether. Um, so I think that's an interesting example, but th there's a lot of behind the scenes activism we're doing with companies around that, as well as in actually seeing the commercial value of this opportunity for them to support healthcare infrastructure. And Yana noted the real surge states that are, you know, the 26 states that are gonna have to take, sorry, 24 states, they're gonna have to take care of 26 states and 36 million people. Um, and so companies actually providing the transport, logistics, food and you know, beverage, basic goods, things like that, and thinking about unique ways that their you know, people and their company can actually provide services. Even staff expertise like legal time um, is something that we're really appreciative of and we are working to kind of harness collectively with the private sector. Um, so we can kind of plug into areas that need capacity building um, alongside our health center. Right. And, and I want to stay there. Go ahead, Yana. I was going to ask oh, I, was gonna, I was going to say to add to that, um, some organizations are also discussing events and changing their events, both as a political statement, but also, you know, in the case that if somebody needs emergency services during an event and it's located in a state that bans abortion, there's implications there. But things like conferences, 
Now, I'm even we're, we're talking mostly about companies, but I'm seeing that in academia also with talk about major conferences being located uh, only in states that provide abortion services and being canceled or relocated from states that are banning abortion services. Yeah, um, Neg, no, that that's that's true. Um, Negron, I'm going to come to your point in in, in a second. Um, Yana, I'd like if you could talk about why it's so important. Nadia keeps bringing up not just the employees but the community. Why is it so important for these companies for companies to support the communities? Um, you know, we're not just talking about privileged office workers that work at these companies. What about all the women who don't work at these companies? How, what's the disproportionate impact to black and brown women? Can you talk a little bit about that in the communities where the states have imposed restrictions? Yeah. Um, well, there's an economic or an income impact that um, research has shown that lower income um, people seeking uh, abortions are harder hit by these restrictions. And there is some research showing that uh, women of color are also harder hit by abortion uh, restrictions, um, you know, especially economically by the increased costs. Um, I did some research uh, during the pandemic showing that um, even the temporary bans that we had early on in the pandemic when there were 13 states that ruled that abortion services were non-essential right. and that only essential medical services could be provided because of COVID, that those restrictions, uh, which held for a few months in some states, had a disproportionately negative impact on um, Black women and Latina women. So uh, we do see that in terms of community and communities of color, that abortion bans do hit those communities harder than um, white women or white seekers of abortion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really critical. Um, I'm looking at Negron's um, comment um, as well, that even if you're headquartered in New Jersey, if you work you know, in New Jersey, but you know, if you're working for a company in, in a state like Texas or Oklahoma or Georgia, um, even if you don't work there, the, the state seems to be sending um, threatening letters um, to the company. Now, companies have stepped up, you know, for example, like a Patagonia that said they offered to bail out the protesters. Companies have certain insurance coverages, again, not providing legal advice, but director and officer's insurance that sometimes the acts of can, can, the company can protect that. Um, at, at the same time, Biden just came out last night that said if it's, um, you know, doctors and hospitals are required to perform if it's a necessary medical procedure. Now that's going to get tricky, tri sticky, and um, I am by no means a doctor, so I'm not going to opine on any of that, but we are seeing these things um, as well. And you know, I know companies are, are also thinking about, we do a lot of work at our centers with employee resource groups and business resource groups. And we've spoken with a bunch of them, um, you know, recently. And one of the biggest things that we're hearing companies are doing and looking to do is one of the companies called them empathy circles, which I really liked that conversation to create the space to have that dialogue. And sometimes it's not easy to facilitate that dialogue because there are different viewpoints. And we want to ensure that we're having an inclusive work environment really for everybody. And so with that, sometimes companies are bringing in outside providers. Nadia, I know you and I have talked a little bit about some of what Planned Parenthood is doing. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you've facilitated some of those and Planned Parenthood has facilitated some of those conversations? What do they look like? Yeah. Um We've definitely done a lot of, I would say, employee kind of convenings as well as teach-ins, um, but really to help people come together to, to understand how to engage with one another and kind of understand what's happening, particularly, um, you know, in, in a, since the leak, um, you know, or in early May of the SCOTUS Supreme Court decision. And then of course, following um, the leak um, and into the actual decision, um, now to almost two weeks ago, um, I I think that we've been doing a lot really with educating people um, to understand where they can access abortion, 
knowing their benefits, but also how they can really take collective action. Um, and some people feel more comfortable than others to speak out. Um, but it's really about encouraging their leadership to consider a longer term plan to kind of create a corporate action plan that does look at their political giving. It looks at their investments um, in business, in other businesses, um, in their vendors, for example. Um, and then, of course, it looks at their political you know, giving and corporate accountability. Um, and then finally, it, it makes them really ask the question, are we willing to put these values out there publicly and sign like the Don't Be Inequality Network, um, for example, which is over 450 national companies that have pledged to support um, abortion rights and impose bans um, in solidarity with their workforce and their consumers and communities. Um, and I would say that a lot more companies are feeling the pressure, of course, from employees, um, but also from their investors. And seeing, you know, with ESG proxy voting sessions and increasing repro rights, accountability, shareholder letters, um, and more attention um, when it comes to social sustainability issues with reproductive rights at the heart of that. Um, so I just think we're kind of giving employees different tools and levers in which they can be active ists, I would say, within their company and also just oh. be well informed. Um, and then externally really thinking about how employees can take action on their own. And for example, tomorrow we have a corporate day of action. We have a walkout where employees at 4 p.m., their local time, um, can either post a virtual walkout if they can't physically walk out um, and say that they're really standing in solidarity with abortion providers and in opposition to state bans. And then companies are able to provide their employee groups with that. We've been working with employee groups to consider how to get buy-in from companies um, to feel good about engaging there. Um, and so I think there's a lot of different ways that different groups feel comfortable engaging. And we've definitely seen it, the, like I would say Fortune 100 companies with a broad group of cross-divisional associates, let's say across the US. There is not always one barometer, even for the what seems like the most progressive company out there publicly, there is not one kind of this idea of what abortion rights looks like or how that should show up in a company. So I think there's still a lot of dialogue to be had amongst company leadership and employee groups to really consider how their values align and that then shows up ex externally, um, particularly from a communication standpoint. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. You know, the other thing that I've been seeing is a lot of companies already have organizations like Planned Parenthood and others as already approved for corporate matches. So that's another way that individuals can can help with the um, with the issue, even in states that you you, you aren't necessarily in. Um, exactly. What what have you seen? You, you've alluded to it a little bit, Nadia, but. What else have you seen, and, and it's going to depend company by company because everybody has different policies and different tolerances, every company, but from an individual standpoint, um, at the, the heart of this, you know, I, I keep saying this is not, I cannot believe this is an issue that companies have to focus on, but it is, and, and they do. Um, and, and as a result, they're the default organization right now that has to ensure reproductive um, Re sexual and reproductive health care. So what what can individuals do beyond, you know, at their own company, especially in states like those of us that live in New Jersey, what, what are some things that we can do to help out other folks, our, our sisters and, and um, folks seeking abortion in states like Texas and Georgia and Oklahoma and Florida and others? I think one is really thinking about how you can, you know, leverage a, a templates of organizations like ours to really write to lawmakers in these states and make noise, um, both in DC and at the state level, um, and really get your voices heard. Um, I think that really collectively drawing attention, to kind of key states um, and balance. And Nadia, things. just to get really specific, what does that mean to have my yeah. voice heard? Yes, so I think in terms of really collectively having as many number of people calling in and writing in to these state lawmakers so we can say that we have X number of people, ideally you know, over a million people that have actively been engaged um, at the state level. Um, and for some of these states with you know, smaller populations like North Dakota, 
um, that, that will make a very big impact. Um, I also think that taking there, we have different ways that we can take action um, together and as individuals on our Bands Off Our Bodies website. Um, and if you Google Bands Off Our Bodies business, there are a lot of different ways that you can get involved. And I think right now we're trying to do a lot around voter, voter registration and really helping people understand how they can register to vote um, and what that means. And even in certain states where you can register um, as an outsider um, in different ways um, and kind of being really thoughtful about how we're also leveraging the business community in those key states. Um, and we are trying to do business sign on letters in states to really show the business resistance um, to state governors. So the more that we can get people behind those types of efforts, um, particularly smaller businesses in those states, I think the better. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just going to add to that, and maybe Nadia can't say this, but make donations to Plant Parenthood, I think, is another um, excellent way to take immediate action. Uh, supporting Planned Parenthood would probably be one of the most useful ways to spend our personal dollars in terms of contributing to this effort to protect abortion services. And I would echo what Nadia said about uh, trying to be an advocate writing, um, writing, you know, um, op-eds, voting, um, doing anything to exercise our vote, our voice, both politically, but also in terms of um, this particular, um, you know, effort to protect abortion services. A a absolutely. I think those are great, great points. Um, I did see a hand raise. This is my technological limitation is that I don't know how to call on you if you have your hand raised. So if you could please put the question in a chat, either to everyone or just to the hosts and panelists, that would be great. Um, thoughts on the Women's Health Protection Act. Do we think Congress will move this? Um, I am not the right one to comment on my expectations of political um, movement or not i don't know nadia if yana you you feel comfortable commenting on that but that is not where i i can really opine honestly i'm not sure i'm, I'm skeptical of the political um you know deadlock in uh dc yeah. so i i don't have any uh additional insight that i can um talk about as an expert i'm sorry about that Agreed. And um, on our end, the, you know, the Gov Affairs team um, has said that it seems really impossible to move forward um, based on the lack of support. Um, so, right. Um, you know, there's another really question that just came in. If the mother's life is in danger, who decides this? Is it a long process? You know, I think this is where it gets murky, even with what Biden said yesterday. Um, and it's going to be challenging. You know, it's it's so disappointing stick in the adjective that you feel that a doctor is literally having to make a game time decision on whether or not to, to do this or not. Um, you know, they do take that oath. So um, hopefully, you know, but, but it's not something that they should have to deal with. They should have to deal with just providing the best care possible. Um, corporations and tax advantage states start using access to abortion as leverage with lobbyists. Um, I, I, I'm not up to speed totally on what the lobbying efforts are. I think different, and, and Nadia, you might be able to speak to this a little more, different companies have different um, rules and stipulations on what they can and, and can't do from a political standpoint. Um, Nadia, do you have any insight into this? I can give two examples. Um... One was obviously in Texas, where you know there's a flood of companies moving their headquarters there, particularly you know the new Silicon Valley kind yep. of bubbling up there. Um, and so when SB8 we knew was going to take effect last spring, really, and we were preparing for it when it took effect September 1, 2021, um, we worked with a range of companies. We had 60 companies come together, national companies that really had a workforce there, retail stores, and you know asset infrastructure investments. Um, and they came together and took an ad out in the Texan, um, in the Texas uh, Chronicle. And they were very active actually about kind of using their power, including obviously recognizing the tax benefits that they were receiving, but putting themselves out there really um, to you know, try and push back against 
the ban and obviously it wasn't successful um, and the governor in Texas kind of doubled down. Um, but it is something that we saw with events happening in Texas to Yana's point, like with South by Southwest, we decided, which is hosted in Austin every year and it's a major boon to the economy there. Um, we saw a lot of people pull out or boycott as a result yep. of, of it being hosted there, um, particularly that you know last year. And then more recently with Florida, I would say that that is, <laughs> Disney was a challenging example, I think, to show around this. And so I think there hasn't yet been enough of a movement. And we're trying to really get a collective of heavyweight, you know, asset managers and CEOs that can put pressure in the right ways on lawmakers to offset the tax benefits that they're receiving because they haven't, you know, but it has to be, I think, companies that are willing to step away from that. And obviously we haven't seen that except for Duolingo, as you mentioned, and the CEO yep. saying that he removed, you know, move away from Pennsylvania. If they banned abortion, I think there hasn't been enough of that out, you know, courage, I would say. And I wanted to, to build off of uh, Nadia's answer a bit in terms of making the business case for abortion rights um, and the power that companies can leverage. I think this issue goes even beyond abortion rights to other forms of um, sexual health and reproductive health and rights, like um, access to fertility treatments, LGBTQ plus inclusion, as well as access to gender affirming care. You know, these are all um, treatments and rights that are in danger, given the political leaning of the Supreme Court and um, our national government, what we're seeing. We need to be worried about these things, and there is economic evidence supporting the importance of having um, inclusive rights, especially let's say for LGBTQ plus individuals. There are macroeconomic benefits. There are benefits for companies. So we can really use the power of corporations to make the business case for these kind of rights and to put pressure on our national government to make sure that people continue to enjoy these kinds of reproductive rights and sexual health rights. Yana, that's a great point because this is much bigger than abortion. This is much bigger than women. This really is a slippery slope to eliminate some of the rights that have been protected even more recently that weren't even previously. You know, I want to back off. I want to um, tag on to what Nadia was saying as well with, you know, I, I feel like we're playing this game of chicken right now between the states and, and the and the companies. And what's what's going to be really challenging, I think, for the companies, which we haven't talked about, is from a recruiting standpoint. Um, you look 70, I think I just read a statistic this morning, 70% of people under 30 years old support access to abortion. And um, if, you know, you're just graduating from college and you're looking for a job, you're really going to start thinking, where, where am I going to move that's going to allow me to do, to, to have these rights. Um, and again, it's more than just abortion rights. It's that full spectrum of sexual and reproductive health care, including LGBTQ rights, including, um, you know, gender affirming um, health care, all, all of that, um, you know, whether or not I can or can't get pregnant, what happens to my embryos, if I have to go through IVF, all, all of that is going to get put into play. And so companies really are going to have to consider that not to put my, I'm putting my professor hat on, my finance professor, to consider the break even of what these fines are going to be versus what that cost is of recruiting talent and that dearth of talent if that starts existing in these um, states. So I think we're, it's, it's too early to play that out. And the other thing I want to just emphasize is this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a great uh, question in the chat. Um, because I know there's some frustration, you know, empathy groups, letter writing, protests are important, but yes, it comes down to the law. And I want to challenge this because private individuals can make an impact and you make an impact by your vote and you make an impact by, you know, the vote. If you live in one of these states, you need to get out and vote. And there are certain areas of populations that have not been actively voting 
recently. And those folks need to vote. Um, the last question here, right. And, and so that, that really gets to codifying row. Um, you know, I wanna ask folks, you know, to, to flip the tables on, on the audience here, what resources um, would be helpful for your company? How can our centers, you know, Yana's at the Center for Women in Work, I'm at the Center for Women in Business, Nadia's at Planned Parenthood. What can we equip you all with to help you personally and to help your company really provide um, the support that the employees need? So you can write it in the chat. Again, the chat is not recorded, um, so nobody will see what anybody is writing. Um, so, so don't be worried about that. And you can also just message us, chat to just the panelists, um, to not everyone else if you are concerned about any of that. Um, and so I think from, uh, from, a, from a, I mean, I think when we say what is Rutgers doing to currently support women, um, you know, I think by hosting these kinds of events, that is our very first step um, to do so. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I actually don't know what the Rutgers benefits policy is. Yeah, I don't I know the benefits policy, you know, but we do have uh, a medical hospital. Um, we do have people uh, who are affiliated with Rutgers who provide abortion services. Uh, so those are very direct forms of support. We support research on access to women's reproductive health services and, um, and sexual health and, and reproductive rights. So there are practitioners who are supporting women as well as researchers. We teach this content in our courses. We have a number of courses, both um, on the US as well as uh, globally that look at um, women's reproductive rights and women's reproductive health. So uh, in terms of practitioners and scholars, research teaching, I do think that um, Rutgers is doing a lot to support women to answer that question. I agree. And we're also affiliated with the hospital system here. And so we are in a state where that access to abortion services is protected. And so, um, you know, so those folks are making sure that women are safe and protected and have safe access to this reproductive health care. Um, I know we're running out of time. Um, I hope this was um, informative for folks, helpful for folks. Know that um, you know you can always reach out to any of us um, as well um, and to our centers and respective organizations. Please uh, feel free to stay engaged, continue to be engaged, find the support for your own mental health, wellness, um, emotionally, mentally, and physically to ensure that you can be the best version of yourself. Thank you very much for joining us and um, we hope to see you soon at a next event.